I would now like to welcome to the stage Kirsty Windier, a practicing lawyer since 1992. Kirsty has been principal solicitor of a community's women's legal centre, a privacy and information law specialist with the Australian government solicitor, and the executive director of a redress scheme established by the Commonwealth to deal with cases of abuse in the Australian Defence Force. Her most recent work has been a CEO of the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory. In a first world community, it is vitally important to recognise and combat the disadvantage that many of our, many of our members, many members of our community suffer. Welcome, Kirsty. the traditional the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of this land, and pay respect to their elders past and present. Lawyers aren't always associated with the search for truth. Too often our professional lives are swept up in role playing or advancing unmeritorious claims. So I consider myself very fortunate that for the past, most of the past decade, I've been involved in work which involves real life truth telling from people who have suffered greatly. <coughs> On the 25th of July 2016, Four Corners aired a program, Australia's Shame, focusing on youth detention centres in the Northern Territory. It showed footage of a child being stripped naked and thrown on, on the floor, being hooded and strapped to a chair, of children being tear gassed, including those who just moments before had been sitting on the floor peacefully playing cards together. It shocked the nation to such an extent that the very next morning the Prime Minister announced that most serious of public inquiries a Royal Commission, which commenced a couple of days later on the 1st of August 2016 with Margaret White and Mick Gooder appointed as commissioners. And I was a fortunate be appointed as the CEO or official secretary as they call it in public service fee. Its terms of reference were very broad but basically it had to inquire into failings in the child protection and youth detention systems of the Northern Territory over a 10 year period and to make recommendations for reform. The facts around the issues that we were looking at are stark and here are some examples up here. The figures go in the wrong direction. They're getting worse. Children are the subject of child protection notifications and interventions at an increasing rate. They're coming into contact with the youth justice system and entering detention at an increasing rate. More girls are offending and being detained, and all of it is happening at a younger and younger age. At a point of time in July of this year, 100% of children detained in the Northern Territory were Aboriginal. The figures that we hear, that are here, are ones that we should, as a nation, be very worried about and most ashamed of. But I don't think that the figures in themselves are enough. To truly understand and to reach the truth, I believe we must engage not just our minds but also our hearts. Those images on four corners engaged the hearts of the nation, they fueled outrage and they led to a royal commission. I do believe that without those images, and if it had only just been said in words, which it had before many times, then it is most unlikely that a commission would have been called. I have a kaleidoscope of memories, of stories, of images of people from remote Aboriginal communities from detention centres in the Northern Territory and across the country and New Zealand. In the courts, the cells from children who spoke to us, the parents and carers of children who are in the child protection system, community members, elders, youth workers, legal services workers, police, victims of crime and so on. From the CCTV, CCTV footage we viewed, some of which is so horrific that we locked it down to the very bare minimum of staff and decided that we simply couldn't show it in a public hearing. You can't unsee these things and you can't unknow them. 
95% of children in the Northern Territory have some form of hearing loss. We heard about a boy who was in detention, and when he was in detention, he would walk all the time against a wall because he was so scared about what would happen if he turned his back to people, anything could happen. There was a young man who gave evidence at the commission and when, we, when he was asked at the conclusion of his evidence why he had chosen to appear, he said, I want to make it better. I hope this helps to make it better. I want it to be better for the people and the children who come behind me because I wouldn't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else. Their life might be okay then. It's too late for me. My life is over. He was 19 years old. The vigorous and lengthy cross-examination by the Northern Territory solicitor of Dylan Boller, the boy in the chair, is, is set out in the final report of the commission. Uh, my children, he was repeatedly asked about his behaviour in primary school during this cross-examination. You were pretty naughty during class, weren't you? Yes. You didn't listen to the teachers? No. You were um, disruptive? Yes. My children were in the courtroom while this cross-examination was taking place. And afterwards, Harry, who was then in year six, who was shocked and outraged by the line of questioning, said to us, well, if mucking up in class, not listening to the teacher, walking in and out a couple of times is enough to, is a crime, then we'd all be in detention. More serious during that cross-examination, and again reported in the report, was a suggestion made by the Solicitor General to Dylan that because he had made threats of self-harm while in detention, threats which he had not carried out, his credibility before the Commission a number of years later was such that he was discredited and he could not be believed on anything because he was fundamentally a liar. In court, an extremely brave 17, 18-year-old girl. She looked very like, hair, hair back, brown hair, she looked very like the students in year 11 and 12 who are here today. She was in the um, court and she described to us her first day in, when she was placed, placed in a foster care home when she was 12 years old. With tears streaming down her face, she talked about how it was the first time in her 12 years she had ever been in a house where there was soap, towel, cutlery, bedding and food in the fridge. I think all of us present in court shed a tear with her. If not externally, then we were certainly crying on the inside. As it turns out, that young woman hit the jackpot with her carer. She had a kind and compassionate carer. And fingers crossed, she will go well. But sadly, she was only one of a handful, a couple of children who we heard from who had a positive experience in care. It's an unfortunate truth that sometimes children need to be removed from their parents because they are unable to care for them or for their own, for their protection. But what's not widely realised is that once in care in the Northern Territory, it's almost very far from Nirvana and certainly a long way from what we would deem to be even vaguely adequate. The 11 year old boy, he'd been in and out of care since he was nine years old. Um, by 11, he was self-placing. Now, we'd seen this term in lots of bureaucratic documents. They, they describe the history of where a child is, so it'll be um, at home and then there might be a notification and then an investigation and then that if, it, if it becomes that they're placed in care, there'll be a placement history. And for a lot of children, they had this thing called self-placing. We didn't know what that meant, so we asked. What it means is that when the child is in care, they abscond from, from where they have been placed. Sometimes there were gaps of at least a couple of months, sometimes two years of self-placing. This boy self-placed on the streets. He was 11 years old. 
and he was on a cocktail of drugs and alcohol. He commenced stealing food and then he was in and, in and out of Dongdao Detention Centre. He was asked during his evidence, and he was now 15 while he gave evidence, he was asked during his evidence, what would have made it better? And he said, again, tears streaming down his face, I just wanted to live with my mum. And he said, but if you couldn't live your, with your mum, what might have made it better? And he said, nothing. I'd just like to live with my mum. Now, we thought about this because Kurt Ross and we, we, you know, it is my belief, having read the material and seen the evidence, that in fact his mother, as a result of his own trauma, and there was no father, his mother, present or known, was not capable of caring for him or the other children. However, was it really any better for him to be taken into the care of the territory and then for um, where he was when he was 15? I don't think so. The places we visited and the stories that are held in their barbed wire <coughs> enclosures and filthy, dirty, dank cells are etched into my being. This on the left is the BMU, the Behavioural Management Unit. That's where the tear gassing incident occurred, for those who've seen the Four Corners report. <coughs> Children were kept in that BMU for 23 hours a day in the cells. Um, so the top one is a cell and the bottom one is, let's see, a, a, um, the, the, it's the recreation yard. So when I say they were kept, they were kept in the cell for 23 hours a day, they were let out for one hour in the day and that's into that bit. So it's not exactly fresh air outside. The shower is in the corner of the um, recreation yard. Um, and is visible by both guards and by the other um, detainees. It is, a, we were in there for, in that re area for about, I don't know, I actually have a, a no memory of time, somewhere between 15 minutes and half an hour, I guess. Um, I actually did close the door and put myself into a cell. It's, it is unimaginable, it's very dark, it, it is, that we, that we actually put our, in this country, put our children for days and days on end and end into there is frankly unimaginable. <coughs> the, um, around, this is at the right hand picture, why treat me like an animal, that's actually um, at around a house which we visited which is no longer used, it was the detention centre in Alice Springs and uh, that's actually the window. So what happened there is that the windows were blackened and so it was even darker. So there was no windows. They were, again, locked in for hours, 23 hours a day for days and days. Um, and uh, so they scratched into the windows. We were actually, we, when we visited around the house, we were locked in there um, by mistake because it's, it's now not, no longer used, it's in a state of disrepair. There are actually, it's like someone, it's like they just suddenly one day walked out because there are actually the, there's still files of the kids there. There's a whiteboard with the names and the rooms of the children who were there. Um, anyway, because it's not used, but someone had come along to show us and they brought the key and we'd gone in. And then they, um, a door slammed in the wind and it had a combination lock and of course no one knew the lock. But I can tell you that of the people we had solicited, we had various people with us, the commissioners, the solicitors, <coughs> um, youth worker, various people, um, about six, eight of us. And there were some people who had it locked in and we didn't know when, you know, when we would be able to get out, um, were feeling actually very edgy. And so I can only imagine how the children felt in there. Uh, this is a picture of a, um, a stills of inside, so not where the guards are, but inside. This is three stills. This is um, inside the bars is the high, current high security unit in Dondale, which is currently used. It is, quite frankly, abominable that children are still being held there. They are today. This incident happened on the day Dylan Bollard gave evidence, so while the commission was running and we had a complaint by the boy. 
So if you, if you look into where the bars are, um, what we were told happened by the um, young man who made the complaint, he was uh, either 14, 15 or 16 years old, I can't remember. He said that he was pacing up and down. He was very upset because he'd been moved to the HSU. No one wants to be in there because they're, again, they're locked in. And uh, so he was pacing up and down and uh, we, we saw the um, footage because this was CCTV footage. Saw the footage, so he's pacing up and down. He is distressed, the guards were following him. He clearly wanted to get away in the alone, but they kept following. So he went like that, and then the next thing, two guards come, they pick him up, shoulder height, smash him on the ground. Uh, he got concussion, he was knocked unconscious, and he was in hospital. What have I learned from the commission? Um, the first thing I've learned is about the bravery and courage of humans. People who suffered terribly in those systems, child protection and the youth justice systems, told, told us their stories and I think they did so with incredible courage. <coughs> they were deeply personal stories, they were often humiliating or embarrassing. And they also brought distressing memories to the surface. For some of them, there was a real risk of repercussions. Despite our best efforts, it was actually quite easy for the uh, workers in the detention centres, if the child was still in detention, to work out who was talking to the commission. And many of the people who told us their child protection stories were still enmeshed in that system. There was also an inquiry for teeth. Because after all, we were just the last in a long, long line of people who have gone into the communities in the Northern Territory, asked what's happened, and they've told their stories, asked what change they want, and then there's some form of report or not. But they haven't seen any results on the ground to date. In fact, things are getting worse. So they were cynical. Yet still they showed up. They gave us information and they contributed because they had hope. And we felt it, we really felt it. There was this fervent, fervent hope that this time it would work, that this time it would be different. Another thing I learned, the power of being believed and of being told that it's not your fault. This is unbelievably simple, but time and time again, and I've seen this in my previous jobs as well, seen the transforming effect when people who have suffered abuse are told, uh, listened to and believed, told it's not your fault, it shouldn't have happened to you, and I'm sorry. And then it was the last week of the hearings last June in Darwin, and we were all really, really tired, and our fatigue levels were uh, undescribable, really. But Someone came to me just before lunch one day during those hearings and they said there's a, there's a couple here and we've told them that they can um, tell their story to the commissioners and to you at lunchtime. We didn't want to do it. We were tired, we wanted to have, to have lunch and we wanted to go outside and get some, you know, bit of sun, bit of fresh air. So we mind a bit. But then we did it and we had a sandwich with them and they were lovely people and they told us their child protection their story about their experience with the child protection, child protection system. It was a story that was similar to ones we had heard many, many times, um, but unique in its own way. No, they were lovely people. The next day, they sent an email and they said words, words really to the effect that how grateful they were to have had the opportunity to talk and to have shared their story and that they felt heard and understood for the first time ever and that it was the best day of their lives. Well, how bad did we feel, really? Like, we didn't want to do it, we'd moaned. And simply by turning up, this had created the best day of their lives. Another thing I learned is that while what human beings can do to each other, and in particular to our most vulnerable, is shocking and horrific, 
Equally strong on the other side is the capacity, the great capacity of humans for love and for sharing and for commitment. So I like to think about who am I, who are your heroes? So just have a think for a second. Who are your heroes? When I think about who my heroes are, I'm very clear. They're the people who on the ground work day after day, often bashing their heads against a brick wall to help those who are less fortunate. The men and the women who work in refuges, those who work in Aboriginal legal aid and this health services, youth workers, people who do it for almost pitiful recompense often, but they do it because they care. I also learned, well, I know, an inquiry is not the end of the road. It is, um, for, an inquiry is simply that. It simply investigates something and it reports. And what matters is what happens afterwards. There really does need to be action. Our senior counsel assisting the Royal Commission said there's a need to confront some sort of inquiry mentality in which investigations are allowed as a substitution for action and reporting is accepted as a replacement for results. There's a tendency when something happens for an inquiry to be called. We found up to 50 earlier reports and inquiries relevant to the same issues that the Royal Commission was investigating. It takes courage and commitment, but, in, um, but implementation, which is usually started, and implementation of the recommendations of, of this Royal Commission have commenced, but it needs to survive the political cycle. Time and time again, we heard of programs that were working only to have the funding pulled just a few years later. It's also very important to involve the community in decisions that affect them. So we went into um, quite a lot of remote communities in the Northern Territory and we would hear in, on occasion that um, about the vast number of fly-in, fly-out organisations, service providers who go in to provide things to the people. And we would ask, sit with the community people, people in the community, and we would say, oh, do you know what so-and-so does? No. You know what so-and-so group does? No. They didn't know. So there's a lot of money in the territory. There is actually a lot of money that is going in. But the way that it is being spent is a national disgrace. And as taxpayers, we should be worried about that. Because it is not properly um, <coughs> that where it goes. In fact, the amount of money and the amount that is spent on services was not something that we could find out because the governments don't know. So, um, it is a fact, too, that there is a personal toll for those who are tasked to collect the stories. So I tell you a lot of stories, and I've worked with a lot of people. This is the second inquiry I've worked in. Before this, I worked at the Defence Abuse Response Task Force for um, four years, where, which, looked in, which was providing outcomes to people who had suffered abuse in defence. The paper staff I've worked with in both were extraordinarily passionate, uh, passionate, devoted, engaged people who worked there because they cared. They um, loved the work they did and everyone worked far, far, far beyond reasonable expectations. One of my former colleagues from the Commission describes it as what you learn, what you hear and what you see creates wounds deep inside you. They heal over time but the scars remain. Well, obviously, I, I fully believe that the primary focus must be on those who suffer, who suffer abuse. Um, I, do, I do also, I, I recognise, because I see that in, in myself and I see it in my former colleagues, I recognise that it does take a price, <laughs> a toll both on the, the individual worker, but also on their families. <coughs> and on the community around them. In the Commission, it was more difficult for our Aboriginal colleagues. The hope, the weight of the community, that fervent hope I talked about, that this time it would work, was very heavily on their shoulders. 
I've been very lucky. I took nine, I've now had, I think it's probably nine months off. I've been on leave since the Commission reported, so really leave all of, all of this year. And a couple of months into that leave, I became very sick physically. My body let go, and um, I think it decided it would align itself with my, with my, um, my heart and my spirit. And I might have thought that that was weak. <coughs> But I don't now. And I think it is, um, it's part of life. And I know that for me, having taken the time to heal and repair and be with my family is, has been vital. And I thank them. I don't know where they are, but anyway, I thank them, my family, so dearly. Um, and uh, so I think, I heard once that what you should do in life, and I just say this to people because different things come up for people at different times, and particularly to the students, that it's sometimes, you know, we're all about action. And sometimes actually we need to do what we tell our, teach our children to do when they're learning to cross the road. Stop, look and listen, and then go. So I, I, I realise that for me it's really important to do something that alleviates suffering in some way for others. To help others who've been kicked in the teeth or who don't have the same advantages that I've had. That's my path. Everyone has a different path. And so you need to find yours, but students, you won't necessarily, you don't need to find it necessarily this year. <laughs> it might come later. During both these jobs, um, the last two jobs I've had, I have found immense power from the starfish story, and I leave you with it. So there was a, um, an old woman, and she's walking along the beach one morning, and she comes across uh, and she looks out and she sees that there's thousands and thousands of starfish on the, uh, sort of beached up on the sand. And she starts walking along and in the distance she sees a um, little girl. And the little girl is walking along picking up something. As she knees closer, she says to, she gets closer and she sees that what the girl is doing is picking up starfish throwing it in the water. She gets within her speaking distance. She says, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? There's thousands and thousands of starfish. You are never going to be able to put them all back into the ocean. And the little girl said, no, but it makes a difference for this one. Thank you.